Hi everybody, just before we start this week's episode of Fish, we wanted to let you know about the new members lounge that we are opening. Absolutely. If you're the kind of person like myself and Andy who don't really go to clubs very often <laughs> uh, because you don't really feel very comfortable there, well, here is a place where you will feel ultra comfortable. It's called Club Fish. It's a place where you can hang out with other fish friends by going on our special Discord. Uh, you can listen to bonus content that we put out every couple of weeks and you can get the full episodes without any adverts. That's right. Ad free. Do you know how much other members' clubs cost? They cost a lot more than £2.50 a month. It's very reasonable by comparison. The clubhouse is smaller, yes, but everything in it is fish-themed. All the drinks are fish-flavoured. Uh, the... The... Uh, the staff are all dressed as fish. It's actually a very luxurious place to be. Yeah, quite a creepy place by the sounds of it as well. <laughs> yeah, well, it's creepy. Um, the coat check is like the mouth of a whale, and you have to throw your coat in there and hope that it gets vomited out when you're leaving at the end of the night. It's a great place to be. Brilliant. Yeah. And if you would like to come and join Clubfish, then the place to go is no such thing as fish.com, and they will give you the details of whether you want to join through Apple or through Patreon. There's something for everyone. Exactly. And just quickly to say, there's so much bonus content. Every couple of weeks, it'll be either a compilation, a drop us a line, which is our listener feedback bit. Uh, I'm actually, the next time we record drop us a line, going to be doing a, an extensive apology for something I said on last week's show. How are you? Yep. Uh, little teaser for you. I <laughs> mentioned a small town in Boston on last week's show, and um, I said it was called Skituate. I had a hunch it might not be, but for my <laughs> joke about where the place was Skituated, I had to say it like that. And um, anyway, about half of Massachusetts has been in touch saying it's, of course, pronounced... Whoa, 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 whoa. If you want to hear how it's pronounced, <laughs> then you have to join Clubfish, and you will hear in the next episode of Drop Us a Line. <laughs> That's right. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. On with the show. On with the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber, I am sitting here with Anna Tashinsky, Andrew Hunter-Murray and James Harkin. And once again, we have gathered round the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is... James. Okay, my fact this week is that in 1910, the World's Health Organization tried to ban kissing. Wow. Mm. <laughs> I think that'd be a bigger story given such a huge organization, right? Especially as it happened 30 years before they existed. Yes. You would think so, <laughs> wouldn't you? What's going um, on here? If you listen very carefully, you will have heard me say the World's Health Organization <laughs> as opposed to the more commonly known World Health Organization. And this was... An organization, and when I say an organization, I mean really one woman uh, <laughs> in America uh, called Imogene Rectin. Uh, and she decided that everyone should stop kissing. And she got in all the newspapers mm. and, and invented a load of badges and pledges and stuff like that. And really thought that if people stop kissing, then maybe we could stop the spread of disease, things like consumption, typhus, all that mm. kind of stuff. Yeah, she, she, kind of, she kind of been completely wrong. That yeah. If everyone stopped kissing everyone else, hmm. we'd have fewer diseases. Yeah. Well, um, we did try it for half a year in yeah. 2020, if you remember. And no one got a cold. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying maybe the cost is greater than the... The benefit. Yeah, well, but yeah. she was. I feel like she was almost ahead of her time, understanding then about mm. exchange of possible germs. I mean, yeah. our mouths are rank. They've got like billions of bacteria in them. Yeah. I know a lot of them are probably good bacteria. Yeah. But I think um, there was a study done that um, had people drink a, like a Yakult or a probiotic drink and then had them <laughs> snog their partner. And they found that 80 million bacteria transferred from one face to the other. Bacteria is tiny though. Yeah, 80 million. 80 feels million. Like we don't know how much that is, yeah. do we? Is there everything where it's like, oh, three bacteria transfers? The... <laughs> <laughs> like, it's going to be big, right? It's such I think a good point. even if three bacteria transferred before long... There's going to be more than there's going to be four, five, there six. There you go. Seven. That's true. Yeah, there you go, they breathe. are rampant. She does sound amazing. Yeah, Imogene Im 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 as well. Imogene. Im 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 Weirdly, some newspapers call her Imogene, 
but I think they might oh. be misprints because <laughs> most of them say Imogene. Yeah, she got a lot of lot, not a lot of support. She got some support. She got a yeah. thousand acolytes, which I think is a good hit rate for this slightly it's a demented good number campaign. of acolytes. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. including seventy brides who declined to be kissed at their own weddings. Really? Which I think. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You may now kiss a bride. No, you may not. Yeah. <laughs> so in the article that you sent over, James, when mm. you found this, there was a nice little thing that she, it starts off by saying that she'd convinced her husband of the risks associated with promiscuous kissing, which sounds okay. like she had a bit of a dog in the race to begin married? with. Yeah, she she had a husband. Oh. So he was a big kisser. Right, I, well, think? I think <laughs> what it sounds like, reading further into the article, is that kissing on the lips and kissing generally was much more what you just did. If you had parties at the house, everyone would kiss each other on the lips women would kiss each other men would kiss men in 1910 that's, that's my party <laughs> that's what her husband was telling her anyway first of all the keys go in the bowl then we start kissing and then we'll see what happens yeah I don't think men were snogging each other that much by 1910 there have been phases when the kiss has been <laughs> mm. in but I think her husband I did just, was spinning it I did yarn. just throw that in I have to admit it was, it was it definitely guessing. said women were kissing women I thought well I want men should be kissing I, men then. I was in France recently I saw I was in the south of France and I was in a particularly kissy region oh, yeah. it varies from region to region mm-hmm. Yes. I saw some people kissing four times. Oh, yeah, but there's bang, more. Bang, bang, way more. I think you no, do wh- get. There are fives, definitely. I've, I've had way a good more. five or Tell six. Tell me where there's a way more. You've had a six yeah, kiss. Yeah, I, I lived on. in France for three months with my grandmother in 2003. <laughs> I've had a six. You start counting when it. Six. Six. I've had a six. Maybe she wanted to give me six. I've seen a Your five. Your grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> no, her oldie mates. All the I grannies so much at, at the retirement. Maybe they forget. Maybe they forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway through, yeah. they're like, ah, oh, I'm going to start again. <laughs> you can be stuck in the old people's home for hours, yeah. can't you? you just... The thing about older people kissing, this was actually one of Imogene's theories. Mm. And she thought that if she could stop older people from kissing each other and actually more like stopping them from kissing children then eventually when the older generation died out so kissing would die out because the children wouldn't have got it into their system that it's a thing that you do that was her plan that's interesting Mm. probably would have worked if she'd again if 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 she's got more than a thousand acolytes yeah 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 Uh, because it's a cultural thing you know it's a learned thing we assume it is yeah i think there's some debate isn't there but i think we assume it's a learned thing largely because about just over half of societies mm. don't do it yeah um so the the number is 46 percent do do it mm. of cultures that were looked at to see whether lip to lip kissing was a thing but what's a culture as in is britain, oh, if you... is britain one culture no no no, no it's no. not like britain it's also it's obviously tiny minorities of people because the vast mm. majority of people on earth do kiss now because okay, we're yeah. a globalized society but if you go to an amazonian tribe or you know papua mm. new guinea or something yeah right. um then... i think it's particularly uncommon in parts of china and parts of mongolia mm. that area is quite un- uncommon so it was 168 cultures from around the world okay. and this was a professor of anthropology at the university of nevada las vegas which I assume is a serious university. Yeah. I just Not associate <laughs> it. I just associate it with gambling. I don't know why. Poor Las Vegas. It does do other stuff. Yeah. That university is a very wealthy one, actually, because one year, a few decades ago, they put everything on red. And, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a huge endowment now. Um, yeah. The first person who kind of observed that a lot of these cultures don't do mouth to mouth kissing was a guy called Paul Denjoy. Mm. So it's D apostrophe and then enjoy. Don't enjoy. Mm. enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good name. Enjoy. He said that some people considered it an abomination and a form of cannibalism. Oh, right. Come on, that's that's someone kissing too hard. It's, it's, that's it's the a step on getting. the road. It's a step on the road to cannibalism. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. So just back to Imogene, uh, mm. very quickly. Uh, I read a lot of newspaper articles about her because in 1910 and 1911 she was everywhere. Obviously, mm. the newspapers saw this story that trying to ban kissing <laughs> and they loved it. Um, she was known as the foe of oculation in the press <laughs> uh, oculation being another word for kissing uh, and in august of 1910 she tried to organize a no kiss august which you know it's like oh, you know yeah. no drink january or whatever they call november. it november yeah. i reckon this might be the first of those yeah you know 1910 yeah. it must be yeah, that's yeah. Very early. um but then by 1912 there were no more mentions of her on newspapers.com so after two years, the How press sad. weren't interested anymore. Do we know any more about her story at all? Like, do we know when she died? Or I know when someone with her name died. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I couldn't tell if it was definitely her. So yeah. I'm not really yeah. sure. She, she kind of went away Can't after two How many images? Images? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 13% of people say they've been uh, accidentally kissed on the mouth at work. Oh, yeah. How oh, does yeah. that? Is that? <laughs> Dad says, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dad goes around kissing people on the mouth all the time. <laughs> no, but the, sometimes the turn 
from comes an, too from sharply. An air kiss yeah. to another air kiss. Especially when you're doing seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I found someone else who has an anti-kissing rule. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's uh, champion whistlers. <laughs> Specifically one champion whistler Who's a guy okay. called Christopher Ullman Who uh, I think has won at the International Whistlers Convention And there are you know, lots of different kinds of whistling And he says he has a no kissing rule For 24 hours before a performance Interesting yeah, he's, Well he must have a lot of groupies You know, yeah. whistling groupies <laughs> Yeah, He sounds great He says it makes your lips mushy Kissing before a performance oh, So no he, doesn't, he doesn't lick his lips which I'm very impressed by. God, yeah. that's amazing. How they must be dry, parched, and dry by the time mm. he's whistling. But yeah. then they must be like a solid whistle, right? Oh, mm. If you've got dry lips, I think it's very hard to whistle, isn't it? Is it? Um, what does he say, Andy? Uh, I don't actually know how he how he moistens them. I've I've only got other details like he can do Mozart's oboe concerto, the oboe part, but whistling. Okay, which is hard. I think most people can it? do any part, right? Yeah, most people yeah. can whistle any tune. If it's a tune, it's whistleable. The problem is none of us knows Mozart's that oboe. Piece. That's Concerto. a good point. Yeah. That's a very so good point. So when his stooge in the crowd goes, I bet no one here can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he does it and everyone's like, is that that? Is that the, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Better to do a plane engine though, or a drill, or, um, you know. That doesn't sound like a whistle. Something that doesn't sound like a whistle. Yeah. Exactly. What would the point, <laughs> what was that? It was a drill. That was uh, Beethoven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've just casually driven by this guy's whole career. No, but it's you interesting know? because I, you know, how would sorry, you... it can't be his career. <laughs> <laughs> it's unclear. It's unclear. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's got all these groupies, but really, you make was, it living out of they that. Are, they asked him in this interview if his family gets sick of the whistling. And he said, I actually don't whistle around the house very much. Random idle whistling is very annoying. Yeah. Well, okay. that's, someone's told him that a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. um, in 1921, in the newspapers, there was a worry about people kissing freckled girls on the cheeks. Mm. Uh, can you guess why uh, that might be dangerous? Uh, this was in the newspapers. Freckles come off. Uh, they go on your lips. You <laughs> yeah. get lip covered in freckles. Can't eat you stuff. Or can, yeah, would they thought to be contagious, I guess, is the... Freckles. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> in yeah. the 1920s. <laughs> was this a justified thing or was yeah. it a crazy... Okay, so it's justified. Um, oh, freckled, freckled girls. girls. Because, because, because they are out in the sun. So they are wearing what back in the 1920s was radioactive sunscreen. Yeah. You're so close. Yeah, so the sunscreen had chemicals oh. in No, it. no, don't carry on with the oh, wrong okay. answer. Okay, <laughs> just try Radioactive sunscreen, which meant that to kiss them would give radiation and you'd become... Forget is, about is the it, radioactive part. Oh, okay. It's the being outside part. No. Poisonous makeup. Almost. Basically, there was Ooh. a um, anti-freckle medication that people were using oh. to try and get rid of their freckles mm. and it was toxic if ingested. Amazing. And so there was a danger, according to the newspapers, if you kissed a freckled girl on the cheek, you might get sick. Oh wow. God. Mm. That's awful because the girls are going to think that their medication isn't working at all because still <laughs> yes. no one's kissing them. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. On alternatives to kissing, which people mm. have had to come up with, these yeah. poor societies mm. that don't have kissing, um, Darwin, who met a lot of people in his life, different peoples, yeah. listed a bunch of alternatives to kissing in cultures. And he listed uh, rubbing of noses, with, like, which Laplanders mm. and Easterners yep. do, um, rubbing or patting of the arms, breasts, or stomachs, or one man <laughs> striking his own face with the hands or feet of another like a like a slap proper slap it's like why are you hitting yourself yeah, yeah. why are you hitting yourself <laughs> oh yeah. right oh actually it's not you hitting yourself it's me grabbing your hand and then hitting me in the face with your hand right? you are actually oh. hitting yourself yeah why are you yeah. hitting me why are you hitting me yeah why are you yeah. Hitting yeah. Me? was that a game why are you hitting me no. <laughs> <laughs> it was a catchphrase you yeah. could say yeah yeah <laughs> Can I talk about very quickly some of the public health stuff, yeah. um, especially done by American women? So this is a group of middle class women from Manhattan called the Ladies Health Protective Association. Uh, and they basically there was a huge pile of manure in the middle of <laughs> New York. OK, okay. It, covered two blocks and stood 30 feet tall oh, i was picturing much smaller when you said there was a pile <laughs> yeah. that's, that's incredible. like the godzilla of- so what they would do is obviously a lot of horses in those days right yeah. they would collect the manure from stables and they would sell it as fertilizer to farmers who were just outside the city but they needed somewhere to keep it and so they just kept it in the middle of the street uh it was this guy called weirdly enough he was called michael kane <laughs> but Kane as in Harry Kane with a K Um, but anyway Michael Kane had this huge manure pile 
uh, and he was making loads of money. He was making $300,000 a year, which today is about $8 million from this manure wow. pile. And his brother-in-law was a New York State senator, so everyone thought there was nothing they could do about it. Right. Anyway, this Ladies Health Protective Association came along and did a court case, and amazingly, they won it. Uh, they basically called it a nuisance, and by the law, that there was no way that he could get around it because of this technical thing they called it. Uh, and not only that, the Board of Health denied any permits for any manure dumps in the whole city. So that's why, if you go to New York now, there's not a 30 foot pile. Yeah. <laughs> I've manure. always wondered why oh, there's not a 30 foot pile. And mad. this group so then turned to spitting. Uh, sorry, they turned to stop spitting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was when um, New York became the first city in the world that banned spitting. Mm. Uh, well, isn't, it, isn't it true that in the middle of Central Park there was a massive reservoir <laughs> of <laughs> spit? <laughs> that was disgusting. <laughs> stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi everyone, we're sponsored this week by LinkedIn. That is right. It's the place to go where you can hire people for your business. If you run a small business and you're looking for someone new, you need the best candidates possible and LinkedIn is the way to find them. Absolutely. Let's say, for instance, you are a uh, political party in the UK. Um, you're <laughs> looking for the best candidates to become the leader of that party. You could, for instance, just get your colleagues to nominate them and then send them to a few hundred Tory members. Oh, I've said Tory. Oh, I've given it away. <laughs> <laughs> what we're trying to say is LinkedIn, maybe it should be rolled out to other hiring places. Absolutely, because the thing is with LinkedIn is they have this amazing thing with screening questions where you can just get exactly the right person for the job every single time. Yes, you add your job, you add the purple hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. It helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Exactly. If you want someone who has the right skills and experience, you can definitely find them on LinkedIn. And if you go to linkedin.com slash fish right now, then you can post your job for free. Free. That is right. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash fish. You will be able to post that job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, on with the podcast. Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is Andy. My fact is that after King Charles I was decapitated... He was recapitated. Oh, <laughs> you just made that word up. Yeah. yeah. So, um, King Charles I, only king who's ever been um, executed. I guess loads of them have been killed in battles mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh -huh. um, but uh, it was in 1649, and it was just after the English Civil War. And obviously, huge move, you know. Big old move. <laughs> Big deal. Political Big deal. chaos, yeah. yeah. But the king's body basically had to be seen. And the, you know, the, um, mm. the authorities, the sort of Republican authorities, wanted to uh, say, look, He's definitely dead and um, he's not coming back. So they employed a surgeon after the execution uh, to stitch the head back on. And um, I would have thought that if I'd have seen his body without the head, that would be even more proof that he wasn't alive. Definitely. What a good point. It what sort of point. looks like he was kind of coming back if, <laughs> if the head that's meant to be off was suddenly back on. Anyway, I should say quickly where I got this from. I've been uh, reading a book. It's actually from a novel. It's called Act of Oblivion. Ah. And it's all about the hunt for the regicides. Is it by, by Thomas Harris? No, it's by oh, Hugh, Robert Harris. Robert Harris. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so... Basically, and it describes in incredibly gory detail the death of the king and also the death of the regicides, who are the people who signed the death warrant mm. and all this, and who really, they really put through the ringer. Yeah, um, Th this is, we should say for international listeners, they didn't put them through the ringer as soon as they'd killed the king. It wasn't like you've executed the king and now we're going to execute you. It was when the restoration happened. Mm. So there was a brief period mm. where everyone was pro killing the monarchy. Like and years. then sadly, yeah. Uh, yeah, after a decade, monarchy came back and then all the regicides got mm. hunted down. <laughs> sadly, sadly, Anna says, sadly, from, monarchy from came back. <laughs> Perspective of a roundhead. I was adopting the character of Oliver Cromwell. Very interesting. So I don't know anything about Charles the First, having not grown up in this country. So I am one of these these mm -hmm. foreign listeners, as it were, mm. uh, that you mentioned, Anna. And it, it struck me that what a big deal it was to kill the king off the back of a trial because there's all this stuff and Oliver Cromwell is a name that is very much part of the, the decision to bring him to trial and have him executed <laughs> uh, yeah. again, almost... a, key, a key player yeah, yeah. And, and the story gets quite gruesome uh, when we talk about what happened to him and the others some 30 years later after the mm. death only um, 10 years later oh, sorry 10 so, years later okay so 1649 Charles was killed yeah so, and then recapitated right 1650 I think it's 8 Oliver Cromwell died after less than 10 years in office and then two years later, the monarchy is restored, 1660. Then, at that point, Oliver Cromwell is dug up 
Yeah. And decapitated. Yeah. So yeah. both mm-hmm. Charles and Cromwell had a, 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 a head altering situation. They should have switched them around. Yeah, yeah. Freaky oh, Friday. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of. Freaky Friday. Friday. <laughs> it was his son, was it? King Charles the Second, who was a direct son of so Charles, Charles the First, yeah, yeah. who yeah. then was the person in charge of the, the monarchy once, yeah. <laughs> the once... person in charge of the monarchy or the king. The king. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's surprising that it disappeared for 11 years. I mean, that is a pretty big yeah, deal. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, just yeah. overthrowing the monarchy. Yeah. It was overthrowing all of the monarchy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was yeah. a big deal. It was one of the biggest things that's ever happened as in a, England's I'm history. I was just saying, as a foreigner, you don't follow. Sorry, we're up to date on Charles the First. <laughs> you have lived here for about 20 years now. I feel like you should have some Yeah, point. it should have been as I was coming to immigration. <laughs> Did you not have to do an exam to get into the UK? No, I'm British. Well, no. do you want to know something really interesting? Um, it's not in a lot of the citizenship tests. Is or at not? least a couple of really? years ago, there was a really good article well, on... Should it be question number one? <laughs> <laughs> there was a really good article on History Today about how um, the... Uh, it wasn't in the test for new immigrants. There was nothing about the Civil War, anything like that. and missed oh. that whole period. And someone asked um, immigration, why isn't this included? And they said the wounds are still too fresh. Um, mm. So a spokesperson wow. said, the assumption is that we are all anti-Cromwell. Obviously, parliamentarian, didn't believe in the divine right of kings. The reason yeah. that Charles I was overthrown was because he really went hard on the divine right of kings as well. He loved it, didn't he? Like, mm. he yeah. prorogued parliament for 11 years, didn't want to yeah. ask them anything, and then told them to give him loads of money. He was into absolutist yeah. monarchy. And when they put him on trial, he was like, well, you can't put me on trial because God put me here, so... yeah. yeah. And now I think Cromwell is a bit of a villain to almost everyone. But in another country, he would be a hero. And in fact, in yeah. America, he's remembered quite well, he's heroically. He's still got a statue a outside of Parliament. Outside Parliament. Yeah, 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 yeah which that's is true. surprising. They're... So he's not. Yeah, and that wasn't toppled in the old topples of statues period that we went through quite recently. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be. After he died, his, uh, or rather, after he died, was dug up and then posthumously re executed. Mm. Uh, his body and a couple of comrades, they were hanged, beheaded, and then their heads were placed on spikes. His head stayed on a spike for 25 years. I, yeah. That is the most amazing, for me, the most amazing yeah. thing about this whole thing. That for 25 years, whenever you came to London, you could go and look at a head on the spike. Yeah. And if you came back 25 years later, it would still be there. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Like I think about all the shops near my house. Most of them, <laughs> most of them are less than five years old because they just all got the turnover. You know, yeah, it was much yeah. less than those days. You yeah. got a lot of custom in the same place yeah. for a head. Amazing. But one person who lived through all, the whole thing was Oliver Cromwell's son, Richard. Mm. So when Cromwell died, he... It happens so often with uh, rulers, tyrants, newly established reigns, anyway. They try and hand over to their kids. Let's get rid of the monarchy. It's ridiculous that someone could have the divine right to rule, but when I die, I want my kid to have it. I actually do think Napoleon II is a good name for (laughs) uh, an emperor. So, and anyway, so Richard Cromwell resigned. He was was not up to the job. I mean, he he was not you know, a, no. a, a zealous as his father and he didn't have the authority. So he he was kicked out in 1659, mm. one year later, and he just lived out his life. Right. He died in 1712. I think he moved overseas. And I think if your dad's head was on a spike in London, <laughs> you probably would move <laughs> out of town. <laughs> you wouldn't yeah. say in London, would you? But get this, he, he died in 1712. Yeah. He lived an incredibly long time. So yeah. he saw the whole thing and he was the longest lived British head of state until the year 2012 when he was overtaken by Queen Elizabeth no II. Way. Right. Oh, and really? when she was 85 so that's the age he lived to oh, okay. wow. so for a long time the longest lived head of state was Richard yeah. Cromwell that's wow. really funny do you, do you know where Oliver Cromwell's head is now oh uh, was it reburied with the rest well, of him no, this no, is interesting it was buried in Cambridge University no okay so I read this in a in a Charles Brandreth book and I tweeted him to ask him if this was true okay. and he tweeted me back so I said my memory of it goes like this there is a relevant of Oliver Cromwell kept by the chief whip or prime minister have I made that up I probably have he wrote back it's in the drawers at Chequers. So Sorry. my memory is, is that the skull of... The skull of Oliver Cromwell is in Chequers. Is in, in a drawer. In a drawer. And it's and I think Brian, I think I read it in Brandreth's, um, Brandreth's uh, autobiography, his diaries of his time as a politician. And in it he okay. says he goes to Chequers and the drawers open and they let you see and stroke no. the skull. You know, stroke so- the skull! <laughs> <laughs> so what I have in my notes is that um, it, one day there was a storm and the head blew off the spike. Yeah. And they thought, you know what, it's been here for 25 years. 
we probably don't need to put it back up again. Everyone's seen it now. They get the idea. Yeah, they get it again. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, and then the skull was sort of taken away and it was just kind of sold in auction after auction and went through a load of families. Uh, but then it was buried at Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge in 1960. Wow. Interesting. Okay. That's what I've got. But yeah. I, I mean, probably like with these things, there's probably 20 of those exactly. skulls around that. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I don't specify what relic I mean. He could have thought it might have been a uh, finger yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. In my head, it's his head. Oh, right. Well, maybe it's not the head. That's that's more normal if it's a finger because I can't think of a drawer that could even fit a skull. Oh, you, I think you can't think of a drawer that could. Fit. <laughs> I can't imagine. Are you going to pull out of that? <laughs> that I should pull incredible. out of that. I suppose I'm imagining a desk drawer and it, oh, those old desks, those tiny got, drawers. Often the bottom drawer, even of a standard wooden desk, will be a bit bigger. But even if that didn't exist, it doesn't take much imagination <laughs> to take a drawer and make it slightly deeper. My head, ironically, my head is not big enough to get around Anna, this concept. Have you ever seen? <laughs> a filing cabinet because <laughs> oh no doubt it's you're too, flip much, your lid. too much yeah. <laughs> I can't um, I can't take it so Anna's amazing Freaky Friday idea <laughs> yeah. which I actually think is a brilliant idea thank you um, maybe could have been true-ish because <laughs> when Cromwell's head got put on the spike there was a big rumour around that actually it wasn't his head mm. and that they'd mistakenly Ooh. got on the wrong one and it was probably some old king of England uh, they didn't specify what? which one it was because it was he was originally buried uh was it in westminster abbey i think, I think you're right yeah, yeah. Hall. so there was loads of other kings there and mm. they thought that they dug up the wrong thing and just put an old king's head there but surely you just funny. pick the roundest head <laughs> brilliant <laughs> brilliant yeah. yeah round head joke Good. it's a round head joke i love it oh, very um, nice. they did used to toss them in um all together a bit yeah. like actually there was obviously a conundrum after charles was decapitated because they don't want to create a martyr of him by having it either yeah. be a big thing bearing him or not bearing him at all so i think they took him away to windsor and they interred him in henry the eighth's tomb weirdly wow and um then in 1813 they decided to dig him up again i think this was to check again again he was there again right. okay. um just the first time again oh, this okay. is charles Sorry. first yeah, yeah, yeah. um and the it was george the third's physician henry halford who was kind of leading the exhumation and he ended up with charles's vertebra and some beard and some of his teeth mm. which beard. is wow. yeah some beard Bro. i'm surprised the beard is Lost. still extant after all that time. Yeah, yeah, that that's weird, doesn't Strong it? How many years are we saying? Yeah, well, this was 1813, 100, so it's 160 yeah. years. What? Yeah. <laughs> <It's a long laughs> so he says that they went, oh, it's not worth opening the coffin again. Do you mind just keeping these? And he kept them. Wow. Other people who were there say that he went in right. and nicked all the stuff right. and hung on to it. But then um, his grandson returned it. It was the 1890s, and he went to the uh, Prince of Wales yeah. and said, well, look, we've got these bits of Charles I. Do you want them? Um, the story, the QI facts that we always say about this is that they used the vertebrae as a salt holder. Mm. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, so if you ever went for dinner at Sir Henry Halford's house and you wanted some salt, it would be a little dish, but when you looked at it closely, it would be part of his backbone. Wow. That's... And That's you a, no, you can fit that in a cupboard. You can. <laughs> <laughs> The eventual outcomes for the regicides, who were the people who'd signed the death, death warrant, basically, were bad. So I think a lot of them were disemboweled. <laughs> They're bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they yeah, were yeah. not good. Drawn and quartered. They were, yeah, hanged until not quite dead, and then had their genitals removed, um, and then were disemboweled. What, still alive. Still While still alive. Yep. Um, got to lie. But if you got away, then it could be okay. And interestingly, if you live in Connecticut, um, near, I think in New Haven, then there are three streets called Dixwell Avenue, a Wally Avenue, and Goff Street. Dixwell. Dixwell and Wally. Wally. And what was the other one? Dixwell, Wally, and Goff. Yeah. So sort of... oh. They were the worst wow. surveyors that I ever had for my house. <laughs> <laughs> but Wally and Goff are the two that are in this book, Act of Oblivion. They're the are two they? protagonists. Wow. Dixwell was yes. left out, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> But well, they all it? ended up in this place, and they they liked them so much in America, obviously, because America aren't that pro monarchy that they yeah. named these streets after well, them. They, yeah, it was a it was a very they were in very very religious puritanical communities, which were already very uncertain oh, yeah. about monarchy mm -hmm. and wanted. It was rights. kind of a place where they could go, wasn't it? When they yeah. were safe, there was another place in North America named after someone connected to this story. So. The wife of Charles I was Henrietta Marie. She was a French Catholic princess. Um, she got married by proxy, um, which is quite cool. So Charles I wasn't there when she got married. Um, so he had a proxy who was George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham. Um, but George Villiers wasn't available either. So they got another proxy and he was <laughs> Charles de Lorraine, who was the Duke of Chavreuse. Uh, and basically they got married 
with this guy pretending to be the king and in those days you could do that i think we've said before haven't we there were various rituals if you're mm. married by a proxy like you as the proxy would maybe have to touch the person's thigh i think that you have to like with... lie in bed and touch the thigh lie something. in bed oh. and be witness with them yeah, yeah. yeah. so oh. the king only met his um wife three months later at dover three so months they'd been married later. for three months when he met her awesome. that's so funny uh, and one of these areas in north america where catholics felt safe where they could go was named after Henrietta Marie and it was Maryland or Maryland or Maryland <laughs> and we always say this name and we always pronounce it wrong on this podcast and the people of Maryland always write to us oh, but now I actually think that because it's named after Henrietta Marie it should be called Maryland yeah. oh, nice. so that's what I will be calling it from Excellent. now on very nice. especially that's because so she good. didn't like Mary actually no. she was because she was French and she was very French um, and she was like beginning Mary. English. She didn't like being called Mary. So the English used to call her Mary as like a oh. nickname. Oh. And she said, no, I'm French. Mary's not my name. Don't even like the name Mary. Fair enough. Wow. Marie is a better name than Mary. I-M-O. Can we talk a bit about the execution itself? Mm. Why? Yeah. It was not. such an interesting... I mean, what an extraordinary... I mean, the, one of the weirdest days ever to happen in it, English history. You know, it was on Whitehall. It was not far from here. Uh-huh. Mm. Um, so when it happened, the, the executioner had to wear... Um, a disguise, yeah, because the execution has never been identified. Do you not for just sure. mean like a hut? No, I don't. I mean a wig, a fake beard, a sailor's costume. <laughs> yeah, confusing <laughs> details. Unclear as to why, really? and fishnets over the face. Okay. So afterwards, after the restoration, there was a big manhunt for who was the exact executioner because we're going to kill him. Yeah. And it, 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 there was... must have been a lot of sailors getting rid of their fishnets <laughs> just in case they thought. <laughs> well, he was ne- they, the executioner was never properly identified. No. One this... guy was sentenced to death for it, but then the sentence was overturned. Did one guy claimed to be and then wrote that they. Oh, I can't remember I about I that. But there's a, there's a museum in London it. that has a few of these relics from the execution, uh, including a shirt that belonged to Charles the First. That they um, believe, you know, they ooh, can't they can't yeah. actually work out properly, but all his all his bits of clothing were sort of torn off him and handed yeah. round. That's auctioned. the Museum of London, isn't the it? The Museum of that. London, yeah. yeah. And uh, among those items, they have a patched leather shoe of a man called John Big, and they believe that Big was the executioner. At least that's. Okay. One of the theories, Mr. Big. Mm. Mr. Big. Mr. Yeah, <laughs> that's what that whole thing. It was an analogy. <laughs> the Sex and the City. Sex and the Mr. City Big. was an analogy was about... for the English Civil War. That's yeah, right. that's very interesting. Can't believe you didn't see that. So I guess, I guess, um, what's her name? Is it Carrie? Guess yeah. so. Carrie Fisher. Sort of... Carrie Fishnet. But they thought that would be too obvious. <laughs> oh my God. And so... she, she I don't called... think it's Carrie Fisher. Is she called she, Carrie oh, Bradshaw? Carrie Fisher's a different person, isn't it? <laughs> Carrie Fisher. I think she it's called Carrie Bradshaw. Carrie Bradshaw. Yeah. Well, interestingly, um, John Bradshaw was the parliamentary commissioner who tried Charles I in Westminster You Hall. are joking. No. I can't believe we're actually blowing this shit wide open. <laughs> <laughs> this is huge. Bradshaw and Big. If only any of us had ever properly watched Sex and City, <laughs> we'd be all over it right now. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is Anna. My fact this week is that in World War II, a Finnish soldier got tired in the Arctic, so took the entire platoon's rations of methamphetamine and subsequently skied 400 kilometers to safety. (laughs) Extraordinary. (laughs) It's the power of uppers. (laughs) It's insane, the story. It's a really insane story. So this is a chap called Aimo Koivunen, and it was a time when um, Finland was at war with the Soviet Union. It was mid-Second World War. Uh, Finland was sort of on Germany's side, war with the Soviet Union, and he's fighting uh, in um, this very cold area with his mm. platoon. And he had been tasked with keeping his entire group supply of pervitin, which is meth. And mm. it, was, it was so crucial in the Second World War. Everyone was bloody taking it. And um, he was really, really tired. And I think the Soviets were coming and chasing them. And he was told to like lead them to make tracks and lead them away so they could escape. And he was at the front. And he said in his memory of it that... Which is so implausible. It's so, it's so implausible. <laughs> he said, especially because first of all, he said, I didn't want to take them because I was kind of against that. I disapproved of drugs. So I tried not to. But then I got so knackered that, look, I just tipped 
a pill into my hand what i hope was a pill but i was wearing mittens and so quite a few came out turns out all 30 of the pills came out and then because he wanted to hide what he was doing from his comrades he just ate them all <laughs> well you're being shot at it's stressful it's i'm stressful. just i'm, I'm sorry just eat them all eat have all the tic tacs basically you know? yes. Yes. Yeah. if you pile a lot of tic tacs in your hand let's say you only want two but accidentally five right. come out you're not going to put them back in the tic tac no <laughs> if, especially if you're being shot at, you're being shot at. <laughs> That's as i usually am when i need some tic tacs <laughs> just drop them in the snow anything and then it goes sonic the hedgehog because suddenly <laughs> I, know, I was he thinking, just eats this i was thinking um, of popeye woo, when popeye yeah. has the spinach <laughs> da, 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 bang, bang. <laughs> suddenly he turns into a mutant absolute like yeah um he basically as it goes <laughs> he received the hit in one mm. swoop and the hit, by the way, lasts for a very long time. It's that when you take a normal amount of meth, it can last a few right. days. But you figure so I think... he took an OD level of it, is what yeah, they say, yeah. right? Definitely. And I figure that the OD level would come to you in one hit. This kind of just plays out over a number of days, and he goes <laughs> speeding away, and they're trying to they're trying to chase him, and they eventually He's just... collected all these rings, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't keep up, and the music goes really fast, and and they're chasing him still, and he's just going off, and then. This is the craziest bit, which presumably you've got more on, Anna, because I, I just couldn't believe it, so I stopped reading. He blacks out. <laughs> <laughs> he blacks out and keeps going. Basically, a few days later, he kind of was like, oh, where am I? Yeah. And it turned out they'd been doing that. And he's yeah. still... <laughs> I think he, he may have collapsed multiple times on the way. Yeah. Basically, yeah. one of the things I found surprising in his um, account is that he said he felt amazing for a bit, quite a short time, I think, where he skied <laughs> like Sonic the Hedgehog. And then he said, something very unexpected happened. I completely lost the plot and started hallucinating and collapsing. Mm. I would say that's not unexpected if you have taken no. 30 mm. pills of meth. But then... Um, the mystery is what happened to the people with him and I think because what preceded this was actually an argument between him and his men mm -hmm. and he blacks oh. out and the next thing he remembers he wakes up and he's completely on his own <laughs> so one sort of suspects they had a chat and said this guy's being so annoying right now he's a massive liability well, post, post meth post him taking post all the pills meth, off. Yeah. Yeah. Right. well they Should took we all just... his ammunition off him didn't they yeah yeah and his food supplies yeah. so he woke up and had nothing well then he started skiing towards some he saw some allies in the distance and started skiing towards them much too late realises they're Russians yeah. <laughs> but he's still got the drugs on him so he, skis, he... he skis through them and past them <laughs> he keeps going he... he said they were so confused they just moved their they should have shot him and they just moved their legs out the way to let him get past <laughs> excuse me yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. he spent all night trying to get to a distant farm window which turned out to be the North Star <laughs> <laughs> it's... I mean, and it's then didn't he he survived didn't he by like chewing on some some tree like a cactus style he boiled pine needles at mm. one point um so it's he still tasty. had pine tea delicious mm. pine tea had some pine tea but he was really starving it was only at the God. very end where he somehow had found a hut finally this cabin in the woods and oh, first of all it's so funny he says i lit a fire in the middle of the cabin it's still clearly high so <laughs> didn't know what he was doing lit a fire in the middle of a wooden cabin and it just set fire to the cabin and he said i just sat next to the fire and followed it around as it burned the cabin down oh gradually and the whole cabin collapsed around him how how many days into that the, was the trip and i mean the trip well he just doesn't know okay. i think about five days but he has no idea he only realized when he came out of it it had been two weeks and yeah, event on its like last day, he was about to starve to death, and a jay flew past, and he whacked it with his ski pole and ate a raw jay. Mm. Again, not the actions of someone who's completely with it. I mean, the ability no. to beat a bird out of the sky is unusual. with a stick. That's hard. With a stick, really. it's Those really ski hard. Ski poles are quite thin. Was People this... don't go on pheasant shoots with just a ski pole, <laughs> no, do they? And there no, is no. a reason. Well, they're pros. Yeah, yeah. Was this before <laughs> or after he got blown up? Sorry. That was after. Because <laughs> he, 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 right. he, so he was yeah. set on fire, and then he was blown up, and then he had the J, right? Yeah, uh, yes. so, yeah, yeah. Because yes. he he found a another little building, and said it was a German post. Uh, but the Germans had retreated from it, uh, and they had attached mines to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So he blew, basically shredded his entire foot in the first explosion, and then he sort of hopped around and he opened a door, <laughs> and then that said that that was also mined, mm -hmm. and supposedly he came to about. You know, many meters away, he'd been blasted across, but he was still holding the doorknob like in a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's the most extraordinary story. Do we think true? 
I can't imagine any of it's true. I think he was <laughs> sitting at so? home. Because we knew he was anti-drugs, right? Maybe he's come up with all this as a don't do drugs story. Oh, yeah, this, this is like a Finnish 40s talk to Frank thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think we know, because his we know from his associates yeah. that the first bit happened and the last bit happened. But I suppose the only account we have of the in-between bit is his. Yeah. Of, with a guy with a lot of drugs in his body. Yeah. That's all we've yeah. got. But, yeah, but he yeah. must have had a shredded foot, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he must have been holding foot. a doorknob. <laughs> <laughs> must have had a bloody ski pole with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dead Jay. He just kind of looked at all these things and like, right, I'm going to have to make a story up about yeah. these. <laughs> but anyway, somehow he made it. I mean, eventually he was found by his, his allies who were the Germans or the Finnish um, and taken to hospital. And um, apparently his heart rate was still 200 beats per minute gosh, at that stage. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's incredible he lived. It's and then for a sort of ripe old age, you know, he just sort yeah. of war ended. In his seventies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, anyway, yeah. it was mad, but the use of meth was—it was big, wasn't it? Was the it Germans it were was. particularly into it. Yeah. yeah, but everyone did it. Well, I was reading you could get these pills called forced march, yeah. which were quite mm. common, even like at the start of the twentieth century. So they um, were a blend of cocaine and caffeine. I mean, yeah. I don't know why you need a caffeine at the point where you've had all the cocaine, but <laughs> it was basically, um, it was sold uh, publicly. It was sold by the Welcome, actually, or by Burroughs Welcome, who was one of the Welcome family. Oh, really? It was a pharmaceutical uh, family there, yeah. Um, um, yeah, they took them to the on the um, Antarctic expeditions, all these the Forced March, yeah, yeah, yeah. Scott cocaine, and Shackleton. Oh, really? But they took specifically Forced March, which yeah. I think they've got to market it in a gentler way, or maybe that's what you want. Is I think that's march. what you need, motivation, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, I can't march anymore. Well, yeah, you're right. Have some Forced yeah. March. Yeah. Um, and did they use that, because they use that, the Germans use that in the war, did the Brits use that as well, and the Allies generally? <sighs> I, don't, I, don't I think, think the allies. I think yes. there was meth use oh, all they? around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. The Definitely. meth pills that were synthesised in the in the thirties. But maybe not for everybody. For mm. people who, I mean, obviously not for everybody. But you know, the, as in maybe it would be for pilots rather than for yeah. um, standard. Infantry. I think it was pilots know. to yeah. stay awake. I think yeah. that's why the allies use it for but, sure. That's so interesting. So oh. off the back of this, I was just looking into s supplies that you take in the Arctic, as oh, in yeah. what, what you know, what you have to keep you going, um, and. I mean, it was. E it seems like it was either cocaine or uh, biscuits. I said no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a student's fantasy, yeah. doesn't it? What's, yeah, you're right. What's on offer today? Same. Okay, so like, get this, Captain Scott, right? Scott of the Antarctic. Yeah. yeah. He did loads of expeditions there. Um, he took some special, specially made biscuits, which were glucose enriched, and they're made by a firm called Huntley and Palmer. Mm -hmm. But he set off with digestive, rich tea, petit beurre. Fancy lunch, ginger nuts, as well as emergency Antarctic and small captain biscuits. And later in his trip, he got resupplied with more biscuits. Cool. I just... actually think that they're some of the worst biscuits you've just named, like digestives <laughs> and rich tea. Rich Where's tea, the ginger nuts, hot knobs and the jammy dodger? Jammy dodger. Come Do we on. have that? Well, tragically, then. this was a pre jammy dodger world. I mean, maybe he would have made it back if he had some <laughs> jammy dodgers. Really. On the first all female expedition to the North Pole, uh, every woman involved ate four penguins per day. Wow. <laughs> they don't have penguins so in they, the Arctic. Or they brought penguins, penguins from the Antarctic <laughs> to the Arctic solely to mince them up and eat them. Yeah, they're cruel and that's why they haven't sent women back to the North Pole. Um, no, this is, of course, biscuit penguins. They were sponsored by McVitie's and ah. so McVitie's provided them with a hard to nail down number, maybe but thousands of penguins, I believe, and one of the women said they were told to eat four penguins a day. Interesting. According oh, to the biography Frigid Women by Sue Rich and Victoria <laughs> Richards. Brilliant. <laughs> so this was two of the women who went on it. They were given six biscuits per person per day for the expedition. Oh, really? Uh, Maybe the person who I read, they got their biscuits nixed before they gave them to her. Yeah, that Told could be it. Bought. It's interesting because that many, it must have been loads of days they were travelling. It was. It was a relay. So it meant that four women at a time were going and then they would be airlifted out and the next lot would be airlifted oh. into wherever they were. Oh. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. thinking you could wear the biscuits as a kind of extra layer of warmth. But maybe, Where maybe the not. biscuits? Well, it's like a, like a, you can make it because they're quite flat, aren't they? They're, you can kind of make it. Kind of, yeah. You can have a waistcoat that was lined with penguins. And actually, and they're two biscuits, and in between, there's like a little bit yeah. of chocolate or something, mm -hmm. right? What, so insulation, you're insulate, thinking? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Where the it just sounds like you're one of the members on the trip who misheard where are the biscuits <laughs> and you've emerged covered in penguins. What, what year was this, by the way? It was 1997. Ah. And so I've got a question for you. Yeah. Remembering that it's 1997 yeah. and they're British and yeah. thinking what was happening in 1997 at the time, yeah. what do you think the newspapers nicknamed them? Um, uh, something the to do with Tony Blair. Bla Blair's frozen women. <laughs> <laughs> Go away from politics. Oh, uh, to the, culture. The, the Spice Girls were big. Oh. And they were in the Arctic. 
Yeah, so Cold, um, frozen uh, spices. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Fro- the, wait, the, wait. Say, say it again. Say the ingredients. The Spice Girls were big. Yep. Girl they're power, going to the North. Power. They're going to the North Pole. What nickname? Go, girl Polar. Oh, oh, girl Polar. Zig, zig, zig Arctic. Oh, Jesus Christ. Girl Polar. Wanna, wanna be the North Poles. No. Two become. Uh, f- five, Sixteen become. Uh, no. no, no two. Uh, uh, literally, baby. everyone listening has got this. Okay. okay. All right. uh, what, well, well um, done, everyone. What do you get in the Arctic? Snow. As well as snow. Ice. Ice. Icy spice. Uh, ice. Ice the, girls. The, 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 the ice the girls. Ice <laughs> girls. <laughs> pew, pew, pew. Nice one, Dad. Wow, Thank straight you. away. Straight, straight in there. there. Oh, oh, Sonic. <laughs> Sonic Shriver. That's incredible. Um, and one of the patrons of the ice girls yeah. was Don French, the uh, comedian. Yeah. Uh, and she told the press that she'd actually made the cut to be on the expedition, <laughs> uh, but she decided to stay at home and comfort all the husbands. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, One of the uh, husbands uh, dumped his wife while she was out there. Oh, no, yeah. while she was out there? Yeah. She's married to Dawn French now. Uh, <laughs> what, was it Lenny Henry? <laughs> it was, yeah. Um, no, what? this is Anne who had triplets and she'd never had any experience before. She's this amazing explorer oh, now. Anne Daniels, she's yeah. Nev- Anne Daniels, never done anything before. But she, when they finished the expedition, all the other women had letters from home and she didn't have one and it was oh, a sign no. that her husband had decided oh, to divorce her. Oh, my God. Let's hear about Rosie Stancer. Is she one of the... She's one of the Arctic... Uh, one of the frigid women, as uh-huh. the book has it. So she was on it. So get this. She's, um, I think she's quite, um, uh, quite posh. Like her grand- posh ice. Posh ice. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. So, and she, like, like Anne Daniels, she went on to do a load of other expeditions. She did one, the Snickers South Pole solo and the Mars North Pole solo. So these are all chocolate and biscuit mm-hmm. sponsored. Brilliant. But her grandfather was also a w- wannabe, thank you, explorer. <laughs> He was the fourth <laughs> Earl of Granville, right? Yeah. And he wanted to be a polar explorer, but he was thwarted. Can you guess why? It was something about his body. He it, had I, a weird sort of inner ear thing that whenever he wanted to go north, he always went south. That's a very oh. creative one. Better than what I've got. Shall I tell you? Yeah. yeah. He was too tall to Did go... He? Because you hit your head on the top of the earth. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he wouldn't fit in the tent. He was too tall for the tent. Oh. So his feet would be sticking out. Yeah, the, and that would obviously kill all the men in the tent with <laughs> cold. Could, so, he not, could he not do like the kind of the embryo position? Yeah, 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 yeah. He was, he was, I mean, maybe this was an excuse and it was his personality, but he was told he was too tall to <laughs> fit <laughs> in the expedition <laughs> tent. Like, what, could, five foot yeah. eight? <laughs> no, no, too tall. <laughs> Could you um, get a bigger tank? Yeah, no, no, they don't exist. <laughs> My cob knobs can't bring something that doesn't exist, mate. I can't believe you just called the fetal position the embryo position. I know, I couldn't the remember. Embryo <laughs> yeah, we've got a phrase for that. <laughs> <laughs> So I read a story which is that Anne Daniels, mother of triplets, um, one of her things to keep her going was um, to just say her kids' names over and over again out loud. The triplets just repeat their names. Baby ice. (laughs) (laughs) But they had very near-death experiences. It was so hairy. Scary ice. (laughs) Jesus. Uh, Okay, let me just uh, cross off three. We've got two more to get. Done posh, we've done scary, and we've done baby. So that leaves sporty sporty and ginger. ginger. Wait. Uh, oh, they didn't take ginger nuts. They took the penguins. Yeah. Damn it. They're all sporty. Okay. Um, but yeah, the mother daughter, the daughter rung her mum to say, hey, I'm doing this Arctic expedition. And the mum says her daughter invited her. The daughter says <laughs> she definitely didn't invite her mum, but her mum decided to go. But they both fell through the ice at one point. So the Arctic moves. They didn't quite realise mm, how much yeah. when you're exploring, it shifts and moves and the ice was creaking and they're wearing skis and they both fell through the ice and had to like swim in skis. <sighs> what? And she said she just oh. remembered while also towwing these supply wagons. They all had a supply God. wagon they had to tow behind them. And they survived? Them. Yeah, they somehow incredible. survived. Incredibly. But then oh, it sounds like God was watching because they ended up, <laughs> two of them ended up managing to climb out onto one side of the ice, but their group was on the other. So they were on either side of a river and they just walked either side of this river and they were getting more and more divergent and they mm. realized they were not going to be able to get back to each other. Mm. And then suddenly the ice started moving and the river closed up cool. wow. and the ice joined together. Wow. The, but it would have been very precarious, as in to walk across that is quite nerve wracking. <laughs> you would have had to tread, you would have had to walk quite gingerly, spice. <laughs> ice. Ice. <laughs> James saw that coming from such a distance. I know. <laughs> What's that on the horizon? Is it the North Pole? <laughs> no, it's Andy's joke. <laughs> oh, it doesn't feel as good when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that the crowd science expert who designed and mapped out the Q is called Professor Keith Still. <laughs> Did you try to say Keith? It sounds like Keith. Yeah. <laughs> so his name's Keith Still. It looks like Keep Still when oh, you yeah. say it in a weird way. Yeah. And um, he's, um, what's the Qs do? They they move, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> but this one famously was a very long one that required That's you true. to keep still. No, it actually required you to keep walking for about five miles. <laughs> it did. But what were you doing when you weren't walking? I suppose you would keep still. That's <laughs> like right. They you always say keep, keep still. still. Oh my God. This is the cue for Elizabeth II. <laughs> this is the passing of the Queen. There was this extraordinary cue that lasted somewhere between five miles onwards. Yeah. And if you were in it, if you were someone who came to London to be part of it, you could be waiting between nine and 24 hours to eventually get to the front of the queue. <laughs> Professor Keith Still <laughs> is um, no. someone who you helps. You can say his name normally now we've done the facts. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. No, we've explained to... the joke, it which almost really works. Now let's just call him by his name. <laughs> so um, he is from Burton and Kendall in Cumbria, and his job is a crowd scientist. So for the last 30 years, he's been. Uh, doing this as a job and he was the person who was in charge of creating a line that was going to be one that meant that people felt safe and that they had mm. uh, toilet stops along the way and oh, okay. he he had to and you know medical assistance and he had to devise it for something that was twice the length where would it have gone i don't know i'm not sure if into we were the ever... english channel when when you drop into <laughs> the english channel because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. well, they did water. stop it at one point they said we're at capacity so they didn't they didn't yeah. use the proposed route but then what they had was a pen where a sort of secondary queue started where you could then go Q from that second queue for the queue, queue. Yeah. for the queue, mm. exactly. Um, God, I rem yeah, I remember that happened. Um, I didn't go clubbing very much as a student. <laughs> but... Yes, astonish. No. <laughs> no, 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 it's true. Um, but there was, I think, partly because one one of the first times I went, you were was... too. Your friends said you were too tall, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, the, the apparently club had a very low ceiling, and they always do. Yeah, yeah. I would have hated it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, there was a club called the Bridge, which oh, yeah. was uh, you'd go to, yeah. and. Um, there was a pre you'd, you'd queue up for ages and I did queue up for ages and then you get in I got in and it turned out that the club I got into was actually a queue for the actual club no that was a, yeah there was this there was this whole oh. and it had a bar and everything but it was basically the queue for the bridge as in wow. you'd get given a ticket and when they called out certain tickets you could go into the actual club but I queued wow. for about 40 minutes to get into the queue club you which must was feel like an absolute chump. I've been to the bridge multiple times. I don't don't remember um, <clears throat> that the old double Q. Oh, but... well, Anna, probably, Anna probably walks up to the front and says, "I'm Anna Shashinsky." Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they ah. let me in the back. And usually. you're DJing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is That's actually cool. quite impressive. The, the, the level of standing. All right. So. Yeah. I hadn't yeah. really thought about the fact that you would be actually standing up because you are constantly moving, so you can't really sit down. You were standing yeah. up for 24 hours. And um, lots of people needed medical treatment. 291 people uh, needed medical assistance just on one day with 17 having to go to hospital. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's a lot. Dehydrating I and mean, fainting. It is quite yeah. a lot. Of course, they could have just not had a queue. I mean, <laughs> these days we do have systems to stop people from having to queue for miles and miles and miles. What, like booking in? Yeah, you could have just gone on the website, oh, like said, a... I'm going to come between one o'clock and two o'clock, and then the queue would never have gotten longer than an Where's hour. Where's the fun in that? Yeah. What would the news well, have done for a week? That's the point, isn't it? The <laughs> point is that it's like this ceremonial thing that they wanted to show how yeah. much, how important yeah. it was and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Professor Still, Keith, Keith Still, Keith, <laughs> got into, Keith um, he got into queuing, first of all, several decades ago. He was at a Freddie Mercury gig. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It was an AIDS awareness gig And it was at Wembley And he and his friends They were stuck in the queue for hours And his friends were all um, Quite annoyed And he was quite Mathematically minded And thought God this is really interesting actually And so he got into queuing And he then his sort of Interestingly first... Queuing for the Queen Yeah <gasps> And queuing for Queen Oh my god We've blown the shit wide open um, <laughs> His next thing he did He went to Wembley uh, Stadium And he He would He got special permission From the Whoever's running the grounds mm. And he would spend his weekends For ages uh, Sitting above the players tunnel Watching the crowds Oh he, he, The match yeah. was going on But he's not watching it I think he wouldn't have been paying any attention to the match, yeah. And he, you would just see this guy sitting above the, yeah. He can't. Um, he said of the the queue, the the one, the recent queue. He would not have been able to have withstand the length of time it required to get to the front. So really? He himself can no longer queue. Even the key. queues he decides, well, yeah, like, because he's old. Oh. He's got an arthritic hip. Um, yeah. That must require him to keep still <laughs> more often than he'd like. Absolutely. <laughs> it's funny because he he um. 
He he's got a lovely website and he lists his hobbies on it. Does he? he? Oh, I didn't see his website. Oh, he has a great website. Ah. Yeah, he owns multiple motorbikes. Uh, yeah. and he plays bowls. Does he? Yeah, it's quite a rare combo, I think. Like having a Harley Davidson and then playing Crown Green bowls. Is it? Uh, well, one seems <laughs> no, quite. No, you're right. Hardcore. Hell's Angels. They were famous for their bowls match. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry, they're the only people that motorbike. I forgot <laughs> that as well. He's got a big Harley Davidson. He's got a. You don't. I, think I associate a... both with real ale pubs. I bet he bloody loves a real ale. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, some uh, some other animals. Q. Oh, I yeah. didn't know this. Okay. Yeah. So uh, ants probably I reckon. Ants. Yeah, yeah, must do. Yeah. yeah. Um, fish. Q. <laughs> do they? There are fish yeah. which. Yeah, there is uh, the small goby fish. Right. They have this thing where they have a mating queue. Okay. This is really this is a bit sexy actually. So only the top male and female mate. Right. And all the other females have to wait in a queue before they can have sex. I I think with the top male, but maybe it's actually there's a queue there's a sort of queue of males. I don't know. Okay. But basically, okay. to organise the queue, yeah. they do it by a pecking order of like sexiness, and sexiness is body mass for them. <laughs> so, the biggest female is the sexiest one and gets to have sex first, right? Okay. And then the next biggest, and so on. And they can measure. You know how in school you had to line up for um, fire drills and things with a height order? Did yeah. you? Okay. We, well, we did, yeah. Were you not too yeah. tall for that? <laughs> I, was, I was always left to burn, weirdly. <laughs> um, so, but the fish can tell their body mass, right? So if the difference is five uh, percent, more than 5% of their body mass, like between one female and the next, they will cue neatly, right? And Because they, they know who's bigger they can see. Well, oh, because they've all got scales, haven't they? Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but if the difference is smaller than five percent between two females in the queue, the smaller one will try and queue jump, uh-huh. and we'll oh, yeah. sort of say this is there's enough. There's it's small a small enough difference. I think I could do it. Yeah. And then the bigger one will drive it out of the group. We'll sort of force it out of the queue. They'll have a fight. Right. What if yeah. during that fight they both lose weight? <laughs> this is what they okay. No. So, no, okay, it's similar to that. Smaller fish will sometimes adjust their own size. They will lose weight to avoid presenting a challenge to the fish that's bigger than them. Oh, so they wow. don't get in a fight and they don't queue jump. They say, right, I'll just shrink my own body. How so do they that do I'm, that? I guess they don't eat for a while. Oh, in the lead up to the queue, not as in okay. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah, not on the spot. They can't do yeah, like a they special. Can't do like, they can't like, like shit everything else. Yeah, <laughs> no. Uh, famous Q um, when McDonald's opened in Moscow. Oh yeah, uh, in 1990. Um, people queued for six hours to get a McDonald's. And wow. they served 30,000 people on the first day. And one Big Mac cost 3.75 rubles. Okay. And a monthly wage was 150 rubles. So that is yeah. the equivalent today of a Big Mac costing 52 pounds 78 pence. Wow. wow. Yeah, and people queued for six hours to get that. Jeez. It's because if someone tells you it's that expensive, you think it must be worth exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, there was um, seven hundred seats inside and two hundred outside of this um, this McDonald's in Pushkinskaya Square, uh, and so nine hundred people. That's about the same as the Globe Theatre. It, it was the largest McDonald's in the world until McDonald's uh, left Russia. Wow. wow. But in a sense, isn't isn't McDonald's really the you know the theatre uh, sort of space for? Um, Keep going, you'll get You know, there. it's like the... Um, <laughs> I've got no idea where well, you're going. I'm wondering where you're going I believe in him. I believe in him. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, he can do this. You know, you've what, what do you see at McDonald's late night? You see drama. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah you know, yeah. you go you go to a McDonald's, all human life is yeah. there. You kind of the, like a like a theatre. Macbeth is a... Um, Macbeth. I love Macbeth. There there you go. Go. There <laughs> so go. much there for you, Andy. <laughs> that was what you were going for. I feel like I did a lot of work in the midfield there. and then just slotted at home. The sharer of your jokes. We did on QI once that the way we load planes, aeroplanes, is totally wrong. So you know when you get your waiting for a plane and they say, eh, if you're in rows 50 to 70, please come forward now. And they load from the back first, which seems to make sense. Yeah. Well, actually, that's the least efficient way to do it. It's way more efficient just to say, everyone randomly get on the plane. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> Run for your life. Close the door in four minutes. Go. You mean the easy jet system? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Leave the kids. Go. <laughs> well, the great thing is if you have kids, you get to the front of the queue. Yeah, although that, that is, is one of the best ways to do it is to make sure the slow loaders, i.e. people with kids, yeah, um, get do first. get on first. Mm. That's um, why they do it, I guess. But yeah, oh. this is, someone studied it mathematically and realised that loading from the back is actually slower than doing it randomly because people bunch up and they block each other, mm. yeah. but you're not loading the empty spaces. And actually, one really good way to do it is do window seats, then aisle seats, then middle seats. Oh, cool. Vice versa. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, mad. Cool. <laughs> I mean, it is an insane way of doing that's it. That's insane. Because you're with, let's say you're three people going on a plane, a family. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
just dad first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now the four-year-old on their own. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Families aside, I do think that is a cool way of doing it because then everyone's slotted, everyone goes to the end of yeah. their row where the windows are and no one's faffing about in the corridor bit of the plane. They're slowly, not doing it on it? purpose, Andy. They just need to get their bags into the... Into I'm the not hole. sure the window seat knocks that out because I you still the, need to get your bag into the top bit. Well, I think the key thing to do is everyone just carries the bag with them and just holds it in their arms <laughs> until the plane's taken off. Then you can put it up in the racks above. <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to hold the bags in your arms, especially if you're on a like an emergency exit seat. Yeah, yeah that's You've true. You've got to yep. put that under your feet, I'm yeah, afraid. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The seat in front of you. Yeah. Anyway... Oh, well, don't fly. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I was reading a website called Line Logic, and they specialize in looking at public guidances and line management solutions. And so they go into businesses and try and sort out how they can best manage their crowds and stuff. Right. And they say that the word faffing directly relates to the idea of getting to the front of a queue and then waiting for that person who's just in front of you who's paid to sort of gather their things together the faffing that they do of sort oh, of like putting faffing. their wallet back and so well, like they, that's the first instance of the word faffing it's what this website says. So, what is this website who are these people it's that, line logic what are their credentials <laughs> i'm back them that's great but they say that faffing time takes roughly 3.17 seconds um that's the average faff that you'll have mm -hmm. yeah that's plausible yeah because you know you can pride yourself on being a non-faffer once you're at the front of a queue yeah like uh right now i've got my wallet i'm ready i'm ready to put the card away i'm ready to grab the thing go you know yes or you can faff yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i wonder which you are andy yeah <laughs> i'm very i pride myself on my non on my you non really yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. oh you guys were expecting that i see yeah, yeah. it just felt like a weighted survey when you explain the difference between the two no, because they do say some people are absolutely awesome and they always know exactly how to leave a, a checkout and you get these complete arseholes yeah. well, well, I, just, I, I, pan I panic i'm annoying the people behind me basically yeah, yeah. so i think time when you finish your transaction feels you know longer to you, you think, I agree oh, God, I often rush off without my shopping <laughs> I'm scared. but I feel you're the type of personality that would want to make sure that was acknowledged and then so you would somehow waste the person behind you's time going Wait, why am no I worries uh, getting out of your way there so quickly um, <laughs> oh just don't worry just another just another day being a hero yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon you'd just go beep yeah. oh, three seconds 24 yeah. very good <laughs> enjoy that extra second I've saved you <laughs> Okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can all be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. James. At James Harkin. And Anna. You can email podcast.qi.com. Yep, or go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or our website, no such thing as a fish.com. Check out all the previous episodes up there. Also, check out Club Fish, the exciting hidden behind the scenes membership club where we put extra content, extra fun shows, and you'll also get ad free episodes check it out now and join today otherwise come back next week we're going to be back with another episode and we will see you then a goodbye <laughs>